Good morning. It's June 16th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with North Korea's latest missile launches. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan have lambasted the missile launches, calling them clear violations of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions. Pyongyang fired two short-range ballistic missiles on Thursday evening. And right after Thursday's provocation, Washington slapped sanctions on a North Korean couple based in China for aiding the regime's illegal weapons development programs. The South Korean government starts its daily weekday briefings on Japan's release of Fukushima wastewater. The first presser focused on calming the public and their safety concerns. We begin this morning here on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles on Thursday evening, coming just over two weeks after their first-ever spy satellite launch attempt. Our Choi min Jung reports. North Korea has yet again escalated tensions on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff confirmed that Pyongyang fired two short-range ballistic missiles toward the East Sea on Thursday evening. The missiles were fired between 7.25 p.m. and 7.37 p.m. and traveled a distance of some 780 kilometers before landing in the water. The launch is Pyongyang's first notable provocation in around two weeks as it attempted to launch a spy satellite in late May. It's also the first ballistic missile test in more than two months. The launch came shortly after Pyongyang displayed outrage and warned of an inevitable response to Seoul and Washington's annihilation live fire exercise, which ended on Thursday. The largest ever drill between the two allies is the first of its kind in six years and marked the 70th anniversary of the Seoul-Washington alliance. President Yoon himself was present on the last day of the drill to oversee operations. North Korea's defense ministry labeled the exercise provocative and irresponsible and promised a comprehensive response to any form of provocation by its enemies. Choi min Arirang News. And right after the regime's provocation, Tsar Washington and Tokyo issued a joint condemnation. The U.S. also placed sanctions on two North Korean nationals for assisting Pyongyang's illegal weapons program. Yi seung has more. On Thursday, North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea, marking its first provocation since its botched military reconnaissance satellite launch late last month. In response, South Korea's National Security Advisor Cho Taeyong and his U.S. and Japanese counterparts Jake Sullivan and Takeo Akiba issued a joint statement condemning North Korea's missile launches, calling them clear violations of multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. The statement also stressed that the missile launches demonstrate the threat the DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs pose to the region, international peace and security, and the global non-proliferation regime. The three sides vowed to step up efforts to promote peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. The security advisors also called on all countries to fully implement North Korea-related UNSC resolutions in order to prevent Pyongyang from acquiring the technologies and materials needed to carry out such provocations. The joint statement comes as the top national security advisors of the three countries held talks in Tokyo that largely focused on North Korea. Also in response to the latest missile provocations by North Korea, the U.S. imposed fresh sanctions on two North Korean individuals, while also vowing to hold those responsible for missile launches accountable. I will also note that today um, uh, the United States imposed sanctions on two DPRK individuals for supporting the DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction uh, and missile programs. So we will continue to uh, take action to hold uh, 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 people accountable for such activities. The two North Koreans are known to be based in Beijing. One of those designated for sanctions is Che Charmin, who, according to the U.S. State Department, has worked with North Korean officials and Chinese nationals to procure materials used in the production of North Korean missiles. His wife, Che Eun Jung, has also been sanctioned, as according to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, she has engaged in commercial activity that generates revenue for the government of North Korea or the Workers' Party of Korea. The sanctions came just hours after Pyongyang resumed its missile provocations after a brief halt in such activity. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. 
South Korea needs to make more efforts to fight human trafficking. That's the conclusion of the U.S. State Department, which placed Seoul in the second tier of countries in its annual human trafficking reports. Our Choi Soo-hyung reports. For the second year in a row, the U.S. State Department has placed South Korea in tier two of its trafficking in persons report. According to the report published on Thursday local time, the efforts of the South Korean government have generally increased, but they fall short of the minimum standards in some key areas. The report says some victims were excluded by South Korea due to the lack of clear procedures for verifying the facts of the damages. Despite being victims themselves, they also face the possibility of punishment for engaging in illegal activities. The report also highlights the labor exploitation and human trafficking of migrant workers, as well as the absence of related government policies. However, the document acknowledges Seoul's efforts to prevent human trafficking have improved in general. It said South Korea has established guidelines for identifying victims, consistently collected relevant statistical data, increased penalties for offenders, and installed hotlines for reporting human trafficking cases. Meanwhile, North Korea this year was once again in Tier 3, the lowest tier, as it has been every year since these reports were first released. The report highlighted the North detention camps, forced labor mobilization and large-scale exploitation of adults and children. The U.S. State Department has been publishing human trafficking reports since 2001. The reports evaluate countries on a scale of Tier 1 to Tier 3 based on human trafficking monitoring and efforts. South Korea was downgraded to Tier 2 last year for the first time and remains in Tier 2 this year, along with countries like Japan, Switzerland and New Zealand. Thirty countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, France and Germany, received Tier 1 status, while 24 countries, including China and Russia, were classified as Tier 3. Choi Soo Hyung, Arirang News. Here in South Korea, the government has started its daily briefings on Japan's planned discharge of Fukushima wastewater. Now, the first pressure on Thursday centered on relieving the public's safety worries. Our Han Seung with more. According to a nuclear expert from a South Korean Pan Ministry government task force, the concentration levels of tritium to be released once Japan discharges radioactive wastewater from its crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant are not expected to pose any risks to human health. Even taking uncertainties into account, it's unrealistic to think that the tritium released from the marine tunnel will fall within a range that could impact our health. Professor Ha explained that the amount of exposure to radiation from the tritium is incomparably lower than that from a medical X-ray. This came during South Korea's launch on Thursday of daily weekday briefings on Japan's plans to start releasing the contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean this summer. The aim? To relieve public concerns and prevent the spread of inaccurate information adding to those concerns. The Office for Government Policy Coordination told reporters during the presser that the government will be closely monitoring Japan's test run of its discharge facilities and provide explanations should any unusual occurrences arise. The test run that began on Monday is not a trial of all the wastewater discharge equipment, but rather a trial of several components, such as the marine tunnel and various pipes. First Vice Minister of the Office, Park goo added that the Korean team of experts that returned from on-site inspections last month is carefully analyzing related data it has procured from Japan, particularly on its custom multi-nuclide removal system known as the Advanced Liquid Processing System. His words came before the Fisheries Ministry, citing the results of the government's radioactivity monitoring so far, stressed there had been no significant changes in concentration levels in Korea's coastal waters following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and that Korea's fishery products are safe to consume. 
In other words, the radioactive releases from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster did not have a meaningful effect on our waters. Korea's seas are safe. Meanwhile, in parliament, the head of South Korea's inspection team, Yugo Ki, told lawmakers at the National Policy Committee that the experts are speeding up their analyses to reach a final conclusion on whether the wastewater is truly safe before it is released. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. South Korea's U-20 World Cup squad made it to the semifinals at the 2023 competition and finished in a respectable fourth place. For more on the Young Tech Warriors' journey to their future, we're joined by Mr. Steve Han. He's a football writer based in L.A. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. How's it going? Good. The South Korean team made it to the semifinals at the FIFA U-20 World Cup in Argentina and finished fourth in the competition. As an expert yourself, how would you evaluate their overall performance? You know, I think the most noteworthy element when it comes to an evaluation of how they performed at the tournament was their defensive style of play. Mm. Uh, this was a team under head coach Kim Eun Jung who got his players to concede possession of the ball, surprisingly, you know, forcing the opposition to make a mistake and then hitting them in transition to score goals. And no knock in playing that way, by the way, you know, especially when you can play this way and still be able to compete with the likes of France and Italy. But my question is, you know, the under 20, the under 20 level is an age group where players are supposed to be developed to potentially play for the senior national team one day. And over the last five years, we've heard from Paolo Bento before, we've heard from, we're hearing from Jurgen Klinsmann now, um, it's been made pretty loud and clear that the head coach of Korea's senior national team um, before and now, they want Korea to play a more progressive brand of football instead of bunkering down and playing defensively. So as happy as I am to see a winning culture develop at the under 20 level for Korea, I'm also seeing a bit of a disconnect in what kind of teams and players that Korean football is developing at the grassroots level and what, what types of players are actually expected at the senior level. That's a very good point. But surely the U20, the under-20 group showed much hopes and excitement for the future Korean team, possibly on the global and national level. Now, South Korea has become the first Asian country to reach semifinals back-to-back U20 World Cups, right? Now, what does it say about our young Tega Warriors at the moment? Well, yeah. I mean, once again, there's absolutely no denying that the players have made an incredible achievement in 2019 and also in these past three weeks. Um, and make absolutely make no mistake about that. Mm -hmm. But now that you've brought up 2019, um, I can't stress enough that when you go back and look at the way that Korea played in that tournament as well, with an entirely different set of players, an entirely different set of coaching staff as well. They also played a very reactive style of football that was a lot similar to how they played this year. And the head coach in 2019, Jung jong Jong-yong, and the head coach now, Kim Eun jung these are two coaches who the KFA has invested years and years to develop as international level coaches. And the fact that there's a striking consistency in how these two coaches had their teams playing in 2019 and four years later this year, something tells me that this reactive style of football is here to stay at the grassroots level. So why and how the head coach of the senior national team continues to stress a different style of football, there's a bit of a concern for me there because I still don't see a uniform way of playing across all age groups in Korean football. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to aspire to if we want to grow and develop into a country that can compete with the best in the world at the very top level. Indeed, Steve. Now, we have to talk about the captain, Lee Seung-won, right? He led the team with three goals and four assists in seven matches. Now, he won the bronze ball as the third best player in the tournament. How significant is this? It's very significant. There's no question about that. And from the standpoint of Lee Seung-won himself, and also from the standpoint of Korean football's ability to produce quality players at this level, at this particular level, un under 20, it's critically significant and impressive. And Korea is the only country that has produced two golden, silver, or bronze ball winners in two consecutive times at the last two under 20 World Cups, with Lee Gang-in and Lee Seung-won. So that's fascinating to me. But for a country 
with a reputation of qualifying for the World Cup at the senior level for the last 10 straight times, I also have to stress that Korea is one of the very few countries at this level that does not have a domestic league for players for under the age of 21. Mm. So there's the under 18 K league, and at the professional level in the K league, there's the under 22 rule. Um, that's been a big factor in Korea producing some of the best players in Asia under at, at the under 23 level. But in terms of securing opportunities for 19, 20, and 21-year-olds, there's nothing there. So it's not shocking to any of us to find out that Lee Seung-won, who was a standout player for Korea, for all his talents, he still has not played a single minute of professional football in his career yet, despite turning professional. Mm. Um, so we can, but you know, at the same time, we cannot force these professional football clubs to play 19, 20-year-old kids. Um, <laughs> Over o over these mid to late twenty you know players who are who are who are peaking in their career. So from a but 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 from an infrastructural standpoint, mm. we can still do something to help these kids continue to develop their games. And the best way to do that is to give them the under twenty one league at the club level, so that these promising generation of players can continue to develop and get better. Right. So much room for cultivate more young footballers and also uh, to produce more opportunities and matches so that, like you said, to generate more promising young footballers, right? Right. Now, and um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. And how can participation, before we let you go, Steve, at the U20 World Cup shape their careers? And also, what can they look forward to or what can we look for forward to? Yeah, uh, it's going to be a while until we see this group of, of, of players play together at any level, unfortunately, because we have the Asian Games coming up, which is an under-24 level tournament that will be held in September and October in China, which would have been a really nice opportunity to bring the core group of these players from this team to test them in an older age group competition. But unfortunately, it's too important for Korea to send older players to the Asian Games because there's the military exemption um, on the line for a lot of these older players. So the hope is to see some of these current under-20 players in the summer of next year, in 2024, where at least a few of them will have opportunities to compete for a place in the squad to play at the Olympics in Paris next year. All right, Steve, thank you so much for your insights and constructive criticism on the young footballers this morning. Thank you so much. All have right, you day. have a good day. You too. Seoul will be bustling again this weekend with the BTS 10th Anniversary Festa event at Yeoido Hangang River Park. Around 300,000 fans are expected to attend, and the Seoul Autonomous Police Commission says it will conduct on-site safety inspections, including traffic control, crowd management, to ensure proper emergency exit roads are in place for the event on Saturday. The event will have a number of booths for fans to enjoy, while BTS leader RM will be there to meet fans. There will also be fireworks commemorating the 10th anniversary of the group's debut. You might have seen and heard of works by iconic Spanish artist Salvador Dali and architect Antoni Gaudi. But what if their masterpieces are reborn with light and digital technology? Our Shin Zaibyuk has more. At the signal of Salvador Dali bursting out of an egg, the show commences. Soon after, the Spanish artist's surrealistic masterpieces project themselves onto every surface, enveloping every inch of the hall. Welcome to the realm of Dali's mind, where his artwork comes alive. This exhibition, Fear of Light, features various artworks by renowned artists Salvador Dali and Antoni Gaudi. And as the name of the exhibition says, it utilizes lights and sound for an enhanced immersive experience. After the highly acclaimed inaugural edition, Bunker of Light, in 2018, the light immersive art exhibition series in South Korea has made its comeback. Through cutting-edge sound and video technology, visitors are transported into the subconscious minds of Dali and Gaudi. Unlike conventional art exhibitions, visitors can enjoy the experience while seated with the visual delights in every direction. The first part of the show, Dali, the Endless Enigma, features 12 sequences incorporating Dali's paintings, photographs, videos and more. 
from the coastal village of Catalonia to his collaboration with Walt Disney, Dallas' imagination and inspiration come to life. The second part, Gaudi, the architect of the imagination, presents the fruit of Catalan architect Antoni Gaudi's mind. There, visitors can marvel at the spectacle of twinkling lights reflecting from a rose window and beautifully decorated tiles at the Sagrada Familia. The exhibition's organizer said combining digital technology with artwork opens a fresh and unique interpretations for viewers. Here, visitors can freely explore, even dance and move to the music. Regardless of where you're standing, you'll experience being at the core of artistic expression. He also hinted at a third light series in South Korea in the future, this time featuring Korean artists for the first time. The Theater of Light exhibition will run until March 3, 2024. Shin Sepyeong, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Matthew Ashley, and we now turn over to stories from around the world. We begin in the United Kingdom. An inquiry into former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has found that he deliberately misled the UK Parliament and held lockdown-breaking parties in Downing Street in a scandal known as Partygate. The 108-page document released on Thursday said that Johnson lied to UK lawmakers when he said that lockdown rules, introduced by his own government, were followed at all times. The report recommended that Johnson's parliamentary pass be revoked. Johnson resigned as an MP last Thursday after seeing an advanced copy of the damning report. If he had remained, it's likely a 90-day ban from Parliament would have also been suggested. Lawmakers on Monday will vote whether to endorse the report. If they do so, it could harm Johnson's chances of a political comeback. Now turning over to Montenegro, a court has extended the detention of former crypto CEO Do Guan by six months. Now the decision was made Thursday and also applies to Do Guan's associate Han Chang Jun. Both are awaiting trial as authorities consider extradition requests from both South Korean and U.S. prosecutors. They were arrested at Port Guriga Airport in March on allegations of traveling with forged documents. Dogon faces charges in both South Korea and the U.S. for defrauding investors in the May 2022 collapse of the Terra Luna stablecoin, which he founded. The collapse cost investors over 50 billion U.S. dollars. Now, one U.S. woman has died and another was seriously injured after a fatal attack near Germany's iconic Neuschwanstein Castle. An American man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and sexual assault. According to reports, the victims encountered the suspect on a hiking path. He lured them off the main path and then allegedly attacked the women, choking one and pushing her down a steep 50-meter slope. He also allegedly attempted to sexually assault the other and pushed her down the slope as well. Both victims sustained serious injuries and one died shortly after the attack. The other victim is still in hospital. The suspect attempted to flee the scene but was arrested after a manhunt. Good morning. After days of unstable weather conditions, we need to brace for blistering heat from now on. And those in Gangneung will notice a big hike in temperatures and it will be a scorcher in Daegu as well. And making matters worse, there will be nothing but sunshine, no chance of passing rain today. It will be just dazzling sunshine and the heat. Sun protection is a must before heading outdoors and south of Gyeonggi-do will have very bad ozone levels today. Now, Gwangju and Daejeon will see a high of 32 2 degrees and air quality will be decent nationwide all day today. Then temperatures will rise even further this weekend and by Sunday, Seoul will see a high of 33 degrees Celsius. With a chance of the season's first heat advisory could be issued, then there will be relief from the heat with rain in the forecast early next week. 
That's Korea for you. Here's a look at the international weather conditions. That is all we have for this Friday morning. We'll be back next Monday at 9 a.m. Korea time. Until then, goodbye.